When I first hear the small mommy from the darkness, I assume it came from a neighboring campsite, a child in their tent asking mom to come in and snuggle in an unfamiliar bed. With the second, mommy, something in me shifts and I sit up straight on my camp chair, head cocked, listening intently, my hands pressing into the armrest, ready to stand. I'm scanning the darkness, grateful for the full moon above the Rio Grande and the dim lights from the nearby camp playground. I spot him on the trail, a small toe-headed figure turning circles of confusion. And this time when he sobs out a mommy, I am on my feet and running before my family knows what happened. I reach him within seconds and drop low to look him in the eye. Hey buddy, my name's Elaine. What's yours? Charlie. His voice breaks and he starts to sob. I don't know where my mommy is. Okay, well I'm a mommy and I'm really good at finding mommies. See that campsite over there? I point to our pop-up trailer and my own daughters who are standing at the edge of the fire trying to figure out whether mom dashed into the dark without a word. My husband Mark calls out, everything okay? Yeah, but I'm gonna help Charlie find his family. I turn back to the small boy. Sound good? He nods and rubs an eye sleepily then slips his hand into mine. Charlie is three. Charlie's mommy is named Linda, and his sister is called Jenny. Charlie fell asleep in a red car and woke up in a camper. Earlier, he tells me, before it got dark, he and Jenny went to the playground and played. Then they had a fire and ate some hot dogs, and nobody would take him back to the playground. The playground that happened to be right across from our campsite. We've driven almost a thousand miles to get here a small, not so nice campground on the Rio Grande, our pop-up trailer next to a non-working bathroom and across from a janky playground. <laughs> We've made the trip without the promise we'd find the man who had never met our youngest daughter. My husband's father has been largely absent from his life, but every once in a while, Mark would get the cosmic nudge to track down his wayward dad and check in. Last time, his father was living in Jamestown, California, a tiny mining town with a little over 3,000 hermits living in it. Array, New Mexico, this census-designated place Lee was in now, 232 people. We weren't sure if a town that size would make him easier or harder to find. Regardless, we had made camp yesterday and had been discussing plans for the next day's Lee hunt. So here's the thing you need to know about your grandfather, I tell my daughters. Whatever he says, some percentage of it, it's a lie. Just be okay with that. You're not going to change him or make him see the truth. Honestly, Mark says, I'm not sure we'll even find him this time. I mean, all we have is his P.O. box number, so you may not even get to meet him. Mark is hedging his bets, but I don't think he's actually worried. Mark is really good at Lee hunting. But if you do get to meet him, I continued, I want you to know what to expect. I leave the rest for my husband to fill in, wondering how much he'll tell them about his father. He does tell them about Lee's upbringing, one of 13 living children raised in a small cabin without running water or electricity. He tells them about Lee's dad, a gold miner, who would leave the tiny homestead and work his claim and return only a handful of times a year with a sack of sugar, a sack of flour, and a sack his wife, who was constantly pregnant. Our daughters hear about the pathological lies Lee would tell others, justifying how he treated his family and later his absence from it. How he made Mark's mom the villain in a story where she was the only thing passing for a hero. Mark did not tell our girls about the neglect, about the few times his mom left Lee in charge and came back to a wailing baby alone in the crib, his diaper over full and bottle still in the fridge. He didn't tell them about how, when his parents finally did split, Lee would ask to see Mark. So Mark would put on his best clothes and wait on the porch for his daddy to come. He'd fall asleep on the top step, his dad never showing up, and his mother unable to get him to come inside until he lost his fight with sleep and could no longer protest. She'd carry in her disappointed boy and tuck him into bed. He was three when Lee disappeared from his life. Same age as Charlie. We're not having any luck finding Charlie's campsite. Why aren't they looking for me? Charlie asks. Oh, they probably are, buddy, I assure him. We're just looking in the wrong place. But Charlie is right. We should hear loud, panicked voices calling his name. There should be flashlight beams cutting across the campground, 
and an organized search effort. At least, that's what I would do if I couldn't find my three-year-old in the goddamn wild. <laughs> Let's find the camp host, I suggest. Maybe they can help us. It's getting cold and buggy, and I'm hoping for a list that will somehow help Charlie identify his site. If nothing else, I need another adult. Today was already too much. We'd gotten up early that morning when the sun flooded the pop-up with light, fed everyone, and prepped for a ride into town. We decided to leave our teenage daughters at the campground, not knowing how long it could take to track Lee down, and not really ready to subject them to a stakeout. Where should we start? I asked Mark. Post office, I think. Driving into town made it clear we didn't have many options. The town of Array, New Mexico has a tiny cafe, a mom and pop grocery store, a post office, several churches, and a rather large elementary school that serves the wider community, aptly named Truth and Consequences. <laughs> we park outside and wait, trying to decide the best approach. An old man emerges from the parking with a small building and makes his way over to a quad in the parking lot. I'm starting there. I point to the guy and hop out of our car. Afternoon, I call, hand up in a wave. He looks up from his quad, a ball cap announcing his veteran status, and a pair of riding gloves clutched in one hand. Hey there, nice day, weather's been good, supposed to be in the 70s, 80s for the next 10 days, good for gardening. I've spent most of the day in the garden working my children, but decided I'll pop on over and see if Sean had anything good for me. He's talking like he hasn't seen another person in 50 years. <laughs> when he finally takes a breath, I break in and ask, you know a guy named Lee Green? Who? Lee Green, Mark repeats. Looks just like me, but 30 years older. He's got box 211 here, and we're trying to track him down. He's my father. The old guy shakes his head and says, nah, don't know him. Let's go ask Shauna. We follow him back into the small post office, and he yells out, Shauna, you back there, girl? A young blonde in a neat postal uniform pops around the corner and comes towards the surface window. Who's got box 211, he demands. She crosses her arms protectively and shoots back. Why do you want to know? <laughs> just tell us, girl. I can't just... Mark breaks in, shakes his head. I know who has the box. The green is my dad. Shauna looks Mark up and down and nods slowly. Yeah, I know him. How's he looking, I ask. Is he well? Her face softens at my question, and she lets her arms drop to her side. Hon, he's not been feeling so great, but he's still coming by. How often, I ask. About once a week or so, usually about this time of day. The old guy wants to get back in the action. Where does he live? <laughs> now you know I'm not gonna tell you that, and honestly, I'm not sure I know. She looks us over again, and we wait quietly. We know when to shut up. Let me call Joni. She may have some information for you. Mark's face shifts while Shauna goes to the computer to look up jo this Joni's number. I raise an eyebrow, trying to figure out what's got Mark going. John, Joni? She died a couple years ago, he whispers. That's what Lee told me. Car accident. Broke his goddamn heart. Well, I guess she didn't die, die. Like, just kind of died. Died enough to move to New Mexico. <laughs> People have been stopping by as we talk. And each one, we ask if they know Lee. We are told that people move here for privacy. <laughs> Some of them shoot us suspicious looks, but most are just interested in getting in on the most exciting thing happening in town today. <laughs> Shauna's voice rings out with a, well, hi there, Lee. She's got him on the phone and swivels her chair around to give us a wink and a thumbs up. Come on by the post office, hon. I got a surprise for you. Nah, it's a good one. Our old guide yells out, make sure to tell him it's not the sheriff. Shauna laughs again. No, I promise you'll like it. You best come by before you head over to Hatch for lunch. This surprise can't wait. She hangs up and tells us he's on his way. We thank her and head outside to wait. A couple minutes later, an old gray Ford pulls into the lot and Mark breathes out, God, is he still driving that thing? As we walk towards it, Lee rolls down his window and his gaze passes from me to Mark and back again, holding tight on my face. Do you know who we are, Lee? He's old now, and he books it, especially wearing confusion and shock. He only has a few teeth, and his face is lined deeply with wrinkles, the skin on his arms paper thin and mottled. Saggy jeans hang from his skinny lips. There's a small spot of blood on his cheek where he nicked himself shaving, and for some reason, I can't get myself to look away from the errant thread clinging to the back of his liver-spotted hand. 
he extracts himself from the truck and steps forward, soaking his arms around his son and me. Shauna said she had a surprise. Yep, and we should let her know it's all okay. You want to come in? I ask. He follows us inside where I announce, See, Shauna? We didn't give him a heart attack! <laughs> you feeling better, Lee? Shauna asks. Nope, he replies shortly. But this was a good surprise. You were right. We take some pictures together, and he promises to come visit us at the campground just as soon as he's back from his lunch trip with the na to the neighboring town of Hatch with Joni. I'm not sure we'll see him again, but we say, see you later, anyway, and then send him off. Mark thinks he'll show, and I can't help picturing my husband as a child, dressed up for his daddy and waiting on the front porch. I don't want this man to disappoint my favorite person again. There's nothing to do but go back to camp and wait. Charlie's hand, still firmly in mine, I'm knocking on the door to the camp host trailer now, hearing their TV on inside. It takes a couple minutes for them to answer, and when they do, I sigh deeply and try to explain about the tiny guy by my side. They ask me in, as an, and as grandparents, they are instantly invested in the problem. They call the other camp host on the radio, explain what's going on, why I gather a sleepy, char sleepy Charlie into my lap, and sit us both on the couch. He turns to face me, burying his head in my chest, and within moments, he's breathing deeply into sleep. My arms wrap tightly around him. I hear a golf cart on the road and look out the window to see the other set of camp host screech to a halt and jump out, rushing towards us. Where is he? The woman, also a grandmother, demands. Here, I say, he's asleep. She pets his head and crouches down to talk to me. I tell her everything I know, and someone hands me a hot tea. I sip it while they ask questions and then make a plan. They take the, take the golf cart away, and I rock Charlie in my arms, gently soothing us both. It's warm in here, and I'm tired, and I want nothing more than to lay us both down and rest a bit, him wrapped protectively in my arms. When the golf cart returns, there's a younger man in the passenger seat. Charlie, he barks, and instinctively I tighten my grip as Charlie startles awake. The man stomps into the trailer, and Charlie turns to look at him. Is this your dad? I ask him quietly. Charlie sighs deeply. Yes. The dad turns to me and says, Little shit wandered off. Mm. Couldn't find him anywhere. I feel Charlie tremble as he sinks deeper into my arms. My body shakes in agreement. He is scared and he is tired. Maybe you can talk to him about this in the morning. I try to reason. Charlie's dad yanks him from me. I feel something inside me cut loose, like, like a murder of crows riding up on my chest and trying to batter their way through my rib cage. It takes everything in me to resist the urge to kick this man and yank Charlie back from, from him. Instead, I say goodbye to Charlie, not knowing what will be next for this small boy. Not wanting to leave him, but knowing I have done everything I can for him already. Lee had showed up at the camp later, after his lunch with the very alive Joni. <laughs> we all sat around and talked, the girls getting to know their grandfather a little. I followed Mark's lead and kept my mouth shut when Lee started talking about my mother-in-law, glancing over to my daughters and quietly shaking my head at their awe. Years ago, the only other time I met Lee, I fought back a little bit. Marriages fail all the time, Lee, I had said, while holding my 14-month-old daughter in my arms. I can't fault you for that. But you abandoned your son. And that's the part that's hard for me to forgive. That's your defining moment. He had storied it all away, making up reasons he was in the right, but we both knew better. Did Charlie's dad know better? Or was it sometimes better for a parent to leave? I couldn't say. I just know that Charlie and Mark both deserved better. That being lost and alone was not the worst thing to happen. It was hap what happened after that defined who you are. When I was pregnant with our first, Mark admitted that he didn't know how to be a good dad. I've never had a good dad, he whispered. I know, I whispered back in the dark. So just be a good mom. You had one of those. <laughs> he laughed quietly, his hand rubbing my swollen baby belly and kissed me gently. Okay, I'll do that. And he has been. I've seen how he is with our daughters and how they are with him. They know he will always show up. Mark got off that porch years ago and made a life for himself, despite the absence and later the borderline abuse by his stepfather. Handing Charlie over to his father, 
I can only hope that that wee boy will learn to do the same.